Hello and welcome to the first of the 12 part series on bio-risk management. Today's topic is biological agents. This is our schedule for the next 12 months. We have designed one lecture module per month in order to disseminate concepts pertaining to biological safety and biological security. When we are first introduced to bio-risk management, we have to understand that there are two aspects of bio-risk management. The first pertains to biosafety and the second pertains to biosecurity. What differentiates these two aspects is the intent. So in the case of biosafety, we focus on the unintentional release of biological agents. In the case of biosecurity, we focus on the intended release of a biological agent. So throughout this lecture series, we will be focused on the AMP model, which is basically pertains to risk assessment, risk mitigation, and performance assessment. So these three components are based on continuous quality improvement. Let's look at biological agents. When we use the term biological agents, we refer to that from the context of biosafety. However, in the case of biosecurity, we refer to biological agents as biological assets. Some of the keywords we will be using today are index case, morbidity, nosocomial, cutaneous, percutaneous, and epidemiology. What is a biological agent? According to the Occupational Health and Safety Administration, biological agents include bacteria, viruses, fungi, other microorganisms, and their associated toxins. They have the ability to adversely affect human health in a variety of ways, ranging from relatively mild allergic reactions to serious medical conditions or even death. Now, the key message which we should remember in this definition is that biological agents adversely affect human health. There are various classes of biological agents. One of the least common are prions, which have been linked to what is commonly referred to as the mad cow disease. So they are a family of progressive neurodegenerative disorders. So prion diseases are spread through animal Hosts. The second least common is mycoplasma. So one of the common biological agent is mycoplasma pneumoniae. It's an atypical bacterium. It does not have a cell wall and does not respond to treatment with beta-lactam antibiotics. So we need to use macrolides. So mycoplasma is one of the biological agents which is atypical, which means it's the only type of bacterium in its class. Viruses are very commonly known and the most pathogenic viruses are the positive single-stranded RNA viruses which include the Ebola virus, the Marburg virus and the Hunter viruses. So viruses can cause viral hemorrhagic fevers and these are potentially lethal and in many cases treatment for these viruses does not exist. Among the bacteria, we have various types of bacteria. For instance, we have Bacillus anthracis, which is widely known. It's a soil bacterium. And the production of spores and their dispersal through aerosols is a potential hazard. We have Burkholdia species, which are found in soils, Vibrio and Leptospira. These are some of the common bacteria which are associated with biological hazards. Among the yeast, we have yeast such as Cryptococcus neoformans, which is an encapsulated yeast and which is pathogenic, especially in the case of immunocompromised patients. In addition to yeast, we also have fungi, which have the ability to be dispersed via spores. So Aspergillus flavus can cause infection. In fact, Aspergillus flavus produces aflatoxin. We have histoplasma, which is spread by guano or in the feces of birds, and candida albicans, which is a common 
commensal yeast, however, in immunocompromised patients, it can manifest as an infection. In addition to this, caution should be taken when working with DNA and RNA because DNA and RNA represent potential infectious agents. As has been reported in a paper, the Novak virus RNA is infectious in mammalian cells. In addition to the naturally occurring infectious agents, genetically modified infectious agents represent a threat as well. Modifications which increase virulence, expand the host range, improve the resistance or increase resistance to therapeutic agents such as antibiotics and which mask their antigens from host immune system. All these modifications can lead to a potential biological threat. In addition to this, we have other parasites like bloodborne parasites such as those spread by the Aedes aegypti which are and well, as well as schistosoma which is spread by aquatic snails. We have ticks and fleas which can serve as vectors for the transmission of bacterial pathogens as well as ricin and other biologically derived toxins which have the potential to cause harm even though they are non-living. So we have a wide range of biological agents. How are they classified? Biological agents are classified according to their risk group. Risk group 1 do not cause diseases in healthy adult humans. Lactobacillus lactis is a perfect example. It's a probiotic. It causes no harm. Risk group 2 cause disease in humans, but the disease is treatable or preventable. Therapies exist and the treatment protocols are well defined. Risk group 3 organisms can cause serious diseases in humans. You can have mortality as well as morbidity. However, treatment exists and vaccines for these diseases have been developed. In the case of risk group 4, for example, in the simian herpes virus, they cause deadly disease and there is no treatment or vaccine available for this kind of pathogen. One of the widely used references is the pathogen safety data sheet. These pathogen safety data sheets have been developed by the Public Health Agency of Canada and they give an overview of the risk group as well as the therapeutic procedures which can be adopted by a clinician in the case of infection. Now we work in a laboratory setting. So what increases the level of risk is the processing of samples. For instance, in this case, you can see that storage does not pose a significant risk because in a stored state, the bacterium or the biological agent is in a dormant state. However, when this bacterium is thawed and brought into the lab for diagnosis, it poses a risk to the environment as well as to the laboratory worker. When this organism is cultured, for instance, for development of vaccines or attenuated viruses, they can pose a risk to the larger context, which means the laboratory worker as well as the environment. So as you can see in this depiction, the modification of viruses or the application of technologies to process risk groups or in, the, in this case viruses can lead to greater levels of risk and these need to be taken into account when you are working in a laboratory setting. So we will be uh, discussing risk in more detail in future lectures but just to touch upon risk, risk is a function of likelihood and consequence. When we speak of likelihood, we ask the question, what is the probability of? Or when we speak of consequence, we ask the question, what would happen if? So this is a risk matrix which defines likelihood and consequence. So a risk which is a likelihood and consequence of 1 and 1 represents a low risk. A risk with a likelihood and consequence of 5 and 5 represents a high risk. Now this is an indicative matrix which can be used for risk assessment. So how do we assess risk? What are the questions that we need to ask when we assess risk? The first question which we need to ask is the risk group. Which risk group does my biological agent belong to? 
or which risk group can it be assigned to? The second question is the route of infection. Do we get infected by inhalation, aerosols? Do we get infected by a contact which is percutaneous and cutaneous? Do we get in infected by an injection which is percutaneous? Or do we get infected by an ingestion? The second aspect which we need to address is the mode of transmission. If a vector is involved in the transmission of a virus from one human host to another, does this virus get transmitted directly, as in the case of the Zika virus, or does it have to go through the host life cycle, as in the case of the Aedes aegypti, Aedes aegypti carrying a virus? Some of the hosts may be diverse. For instance, Cryptococcus is actually present in plants, spread via spores and infects humans, but it's also present in bird excreta or in bird droppings. And these can be vectors for the transmission of this specific pathogen. In addition to the route of transmission, we also have to look at the host range. Some viruses can survive and propagate in multiple series of hosts. They can propagate in mammals as well as in snails. So we need to consider this aspect when we develop a bio-risk management plan. The next question is infectious dose. How much of the biological agent is required in order to cause harm? In this case, morbidity or mortality. The next aspect is endemicity. Is the biological agent endemic to this specific region? So if it's endemic, if a biological agent is endemic to a specific region, a geographic region in this case, it, it is likely that the individuals who are endemic to that region have developed some level of immunity to this biological agent. In addition to this, we need to look at the immune status of the laboratory worker. Is the laboratory worker immunocompromised? So if they are immunocompromised, you need to put in place measures to mitigate the risk posed to this laboratory worker. So finally, we come down to the risk assessment, which is basically a series of questions which we ask. What is the biological agent? What is the risk group which can be assigned to? Is it endemic or exotic? Which risk group can it be assigned to? What is the mode of transmission? What is the route of infection? What is the infectious dose and is treatment available? When we do risk assessment in the laboratory, these are some of the questions which we need to ask. What is the immune status of the laboratory workers? What are the processes that will be employed in the laboratory workers as well as the volume of the culture which is going to be processed? How many processes are involved? Does the laboratory work involve a single step or does it en encompass multiple steps? How many workers are exposed? Have they been trained? And has a facility been designed for a specific purpose? When we do risk assessment, we always address the iceberg analogy, in which case a large portion of the risk is actually present but not visible and may not be uh, able, you may not be able to assess this risk using traditional approaches or traditional questions because there is no knowledge pertaining to previous cases. We can only see the risk which is visible or which appears as a result of specific questions. So in this case, we assume the highest level of risk. So pertaining to the iceberg analogy, we always assume the highest level of risk in the case of genetically engineered molecules, be it RNA or DNA. Nosocomial samples, which may contain a multiplicity of biological agents or pathogens. Soil samples, which may lead to potential sporulation, or the, which may lead to the development of bacteria or fungi with spores. Samples derived from healthy organisms, which may not present the symptoms of infection, however, which may be a host for that specific pathogen, and samples derived from wild animals. So once we address 
to assess the risk. We then mitigate the risk by the application of five controls, which are elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment. Once we have applied the control, we assess the performance of our controls by carrying out an audit of the processes and the standard operating procedures. These are some of the references which have been relied upon to develop this presentation. Our next module will focus on risk assessment. Thank you for participating in this biorisk management series.